I just want to introduce myself briefly. I want to keep this kind of short. Uh, my name is Dave Ross. Uh, I was born and raised in Chicago, where uh, my most recent job out there, I was a lead developer for an online marketing company called Straight North. We did search engine optimization, pay-per-click ads, social media marketing, all that online marketing that you needed. Uh, we did custom website development. And I just moved to the Boston area. Actually, the, I just finished my second week as a Bostonian. So uh, I start a new job out here next week. So this is a really exciting time for me. I also want to stress that I'm out of the SEO industry right now. So I hope I can be kind of honest with you guys about it. And uh, hope you realize I'm not trying to sell you something here. And uh, this is my first time speaking at a WordCamp, so I'm really excited about that. I'm also excited to see that there are three SEO presentations going on concurrently right now. Everything from beginner, intermediate, and now here in the developer room. So this is exciting. There's a lot of good information for all levels of experience. I hope you all take the time and watch the videos when they put them up on the web for the sessions you couldn't attend. I'm sure there's a lot of good information in all of them. And I would love to go through the room and just have you all stand up and tell a bit about yourselves, because that would take the whole amount of time we have. So I am going to make some assumptions about all of you, OK? And I hope I'm not being mean about this. I'm going to assume since this is a developer session, you guys can write some HTML, right? You, you can handle that. And since this is a WordCamp developer session, I'm going to assume you can at least make edits to an existing WordPress theme or you can even better develop your own complete loop from scratch. Okay, again, I think those are safe assumptions. If that's not you, you know, if, if you want to leave, I, I totally understand. I hope you stay. I hope you at least get something out of this, and I hope you enjoy it. So I want to set the Wayback Machine to 1998. Uh, the search engine landscape was very interesting back then. We had uh, Yahoo, uh, Lycos, Dogpile, AltaVista, Ask Jeeves was a favorite of mine. Uh, and then along came this little Stanford research project called Google. And it came with it a, a novel uh, algorithm for determining search engine result placement. They called it PageRank, which according to Wikipedia is named after Larry Page. I don't know if I necessarily believe that. But the basic idea behind PageRank is it looked at all the pages that linked to an individual page on the web. And it used that to determine a, a, what they call a page rank value, a ranking, a, a, an authority level. So if you have 10 pages linking to your page using the words used cars, then Google would assume that your page is an authority on the term of used cars. And this was recursive in that now that you've built up all this page rank for used cars, any link that you send outbound about used cars gain a little extra weight because of its association with you. This was a big change to how the web worked. It, it improved search engine results almost overnight because of Google's own search results and the pressure it put on their competitors. And I'm telling you all this to give a little background on the search engine optimization field, because it sprang up almost overnight with the success of Google. There was an entire ecosystem of companies, books, videos, and the like that grew up to, to help companies and individuals get their pages ranked highly in Google's results. And there were, all, of course, some snake oil salesmen too, right? People just making things up as they went along and selling some really bad advice and charging hundreds of dollars an hour, right? That's inevitable. And uh, Google certainly wasn't helping us. They weren't really giving any detailed information aside from page rank, because that's a patented process. They weren't giving us any of the real details on how they calculated page rank and, and where things appeared in their, their search results. And to people outside of our industry, I've got to admit, it really must have sounded like a game of Calvin Ball. Anybody out here not recognize uh, Calvin and Hobbes at all? It was a comic big in the 90s about a, a young boy and his, uh, his stuffed tiger that came to life in his imagination. And, and one of the things they did is they played Calvin Ball. 
and it was a game where the only rule was you made up the rules as you went along. And that's what SEO sounded like to a lot of people. It sounded like we were just making things up and seeing what stuck, seeing what worked. And in a lot of ways, it kind of was. Every once in a while, Google would let Matt Cuts release a little bit of information here or there, but we had no authoritative information. But there were a lot of people that found ways to game the system. And Google started developing a reputation problem around 2011. Uh, you start seeing a lot of blog posts, a lot of comments in social media that, hey, Google has really gone down the tubes. You start seeing things like, going back to that used cars example, uh, I can't say you know, this is an actual example, but uh, you could search for used cars and the first result would be a spammy page that didn't really have anything to do with used cars. And that would appear in the rankings before used car dealerships and before pages about how to buy a used car. And that just wasn't helping people at all. So Google hired this engineer, an artificial intelligence researcher named Nebi Kanda, and they put him to work developing PageRank's replacement. Uh, it was based on content quality. The idea was he got a bunch of human beings, a bunch of people together, and they went through hundreds of thousands of web pages. And they've determined, is this a good page? Is this a bad page? Kind of like a spam filter, right? You mark this is spam, and then the system looks at emails and tries to find ones that look like that spam. Same exact principle. He fed those decisions into a neural network. And the artificial intelligence behind that neural network is able to look at web pages and determine, is this a good page? Is this a bad page? And the Panda filter became the basis of the Panda update, also from last year. The core, of course, was Panda filter. It also looked at how many ads were on a website. It was a common practice for, for these spammy companies to put their content out there with 5, 10, 15 ads on a page. Even some newspaper websites were getting in on that. And Google didn't like it because it was a bad experience for the end user. They also looked at uh, web scrapers. There are bots that go out there and they'll steal content from blogs and other websites and they'll put it up on their own site, surrounded by ads, sometimes later replace the byline so it looks like they offer it. And Google, Google really didn't like that because sometimes those would appear higher in the search results than the original content that they stole. They also start looking at page layout, oddly enough. The relative size of your content versus your sidebars, your advertising, your logo, and, and so forth. And then this year they came out with the penguin update, which actually isn't named after a person this time, it's actually named after the flightless bird. And this went after uh, black hat SEO tactics. It looked at things like keyword stuffing. Now, of course, we all know about uh, keyword frequency, right? If you're writing about used cars, you want that to appear in your content a certain amount of times, right? But there were sites that were artificially injecting keywords into the content in ways that didn't even make sense grammatically. And uh, Google really wanted to target that. They wanted to target cloaking, which is a practice where you would serve Google's bots, their spiders, a page that was completely different from what anyone else saw in their web browser. Uh, sometimes this would be very specific search engine targeted content. Sometimes it would just be a stripped down version without all the ads and other distractions. But Google didn't like it. They wanted to base their search ranking on what everyday users were seeing. And they targeted link schemes, this whole process of selling links on other websites. Uh, they looked at links that didn't have anything to do with the purported content of the page. And they looked for duplicate content. A good example of this is back home, there was a, a small medical clinic. And they, had, uh, they served our particular suburb and all the surrounding suburbs. And each of those suburbs got a page on their website where the content was all identical for each of these suburbs, each of these pages, except the name of the city was changed and the color scheme was different. And Google really doesn't like stuff like that because that information is not useful to anybody but search engines. And again, they're concerned about the end user experience. So now, if you'll pardon the expression, we are in a post-penguin world. Uh, the rules of search engine optimization have seriously changed. 
And now the basic rules of SEO are give search engines info and let them make the decisions where to position it and how things are displayed. I won't say it's a catastrophic change for search engine optimization, but it is a big, major change in how we do things. Google and Bing are both making use of uh, what are called rich snippets. So, uh, the other day I did a search for tacos, because I love tacos, right? Who doesn't? And you can see right here, uh, it's, it's kind of a little pixelated here, right? But uh, these are some good looking tacos. Got a really nice big slice of onion there. It looks like some cilantro. Those are good tacos. They come from the food network. You can see right here in the Google search results, this is a kid-friendly recipe for tacos. Not only that, it got five stars out of five from 128 reviews. And it only takes an hour and 45 minutes to, to prepare. And I'm assuming some of that time is marinating and grilling, right? So. Okay, if I got two hours to kill, I want to make some tacos. Google has just told me where to find a good recipe for them. If I don't feel like cooking, if I'm in Culver City, California, I might want to check out Tito's Tacos up on the top. And Google will give me a map to get to Tito, Tito's Tacos. And presumably from that map, I can get directions. And then uh, if I'm in Dallas, I can go to Tacos El Zuero. They have a uh, Yelp's review there. Four and a half stars out of five, not bad, not bad, out of 91 reviews. And it has a price range of a single dollar sign. Usually that's about 10 bucks for me. So these are good, cheap tacos. And that's, that's I'm always happy to go about good, cheap tacos. And again, I'm finding all of this in the Google search results. Google is able to look at pages now and identify reviews, comments, uh, maps, even deep links, they will look at your site's navigation and reproduce your menu in the Google search results. All of this is to provide the best information right to the end user. And of course, of course they're selling advertising next to it. Of course, that's Google's business model. Same with any of the other search engines. I don't mean to pick on Google specifically here. But um, it, is, it is the changing face of, of how search engines work in, in the post-Penguin world. They've given us some tools to make search engine optimization a little easier in this, in this context. We have rel equals author and rel equals publisher. These are tags you can add to a page that let you authoritatively say, I authored this content. And these are pointers to your Google Plus account. And uh, when they show up in the search results, they include your, your headshot and a little bio of you. And this is a good way to build personal branding. It's a way for people to start getting used to seeing your face next to content that they like. And eventually they're going to start associating you with good content. Can I ask you a quick question about that? Sure. Um, is it better to have your face like your bio, or to have your logo? Is My personal opinion is uh, whatever you're more comfortable with. Some people, especially if they change jobs frequently or they write for multiple sites, okay. they might want to have it tied to their personal, uh, to their personal mm -hmm. image. If, uh, if they're writing for a brand, then they may want the, the content associated with their brand. You know, I, I wrote a lot of blog entries for my previous employer that they probably want their logo on instead of mine because I don't work there anymore. They still want the good karma from, uh, from being associated with those posts. So it really is a judgment call, like so many things in life. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Google and Bing and the other search engines are able to look at the new HTML5 semantic elements, things like article and uh, nav. And they're able to parse out the individual sections of your website. And uh, they've also provided us a tool called schema.org microdata. Schema.org is a collaboration started out with Google and Bing and then a couple months after that, Yahoo came on board, and then they bought Yahoo. <laughs> then about a year after that, Yandex joined in. Yandex is Russia's biggest search engine. So we have the, the titans of search coming together on a project here. Schema.org is, first of all, a website. Not the prettiest website, but it is a website. And it's also a blog. And they use this as the place to give us the information on the Schema.org microdata format. And Schema.org microdata, microdata in general, is a way to mark up things in our web pages. Uh, for, you, uh, for you programmers out there, these would 
be your, your classes in an object-oriented sense. For you uh, English lit majors, these are nouns. Okay, these, these are things like comments, maps, reviews, uh, blog entries, even individual pages like a checkout page on your e-commerce site. These can also be real-world things like books, uh, people, uh, recipes, reviews, TV episodes. And these can even be really specific things like a motorcycle dealer, a gated community, a medical clinic. In fact, um, in late June, uh, just a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a big announcement that a whole bunch of new schemas were defined for medical uh, related uh, topics. It was a collaboration with medical research facilities and other experts in the field, including people just down the road at Harvard, on uh, defining a whole bunch of schemas for medical conditions, medical treatments, medical clinics, and the like. And you can see the full list. There's about 550 schemas defined right now. I believe the exact count was 549 when I put these slides together. And you can get to them by going to schema.org, clicking on documentation up in the menu. And then I believe the second or third link down is uh, for a full list of schemas. Now, how are we going to be able to use this? This is great in theory, right? Microdata is a spec within the HTML5 standard. Uh, the What Working Group and the W3C have given us a set of attributes we can use to mark up microdata within our web pages. Two of the, the main ones are item scope and item type. These can appear on any tag that can have children, any element that can have children, including the body tag. And that's an important one. We'll come back to that one. And of course, item scope just says that this tag represents a thing. Item type points to a particular schema for the definition of that thing. And you can use your own URLs here, your own taxonomy of what things are. But as web developers, the things that really matter to us most right now are the schema.org uh, standards. Now, if you go to schema.org and you look at the types that they've defined, I have uh, the movie type here. You can see that schema.org defines a hierarchy for their types. A movie is a creative work, and a creative work is a, a type of thing. Again, if you're a programmer, this is inheritance, right? And also, um, the, these types can have uh, properties. So uh, it's kind of cut off here. But a movie has properties for actors, right? Every movie has an actor, or is a couple, unless it's all computer generated, has a director, producer, and so forth. Since a movie is a creative work, it inherits fields from creative work. Things like the intended audience and the content rating. Is this rated PG? Is it rated R? And since every schema is also a thing, it inherits four basic fields from thing. It inherits description, image, name, and URL. These are fields that you can use in your page to provide information about the things on your page. Use, you do that using the item prop attribute. You're saying this particular tag represents this property of that, that thing we defined previously in your item scope and item type. So in this case, we're looking at the movie Total Recall, the original 1990 Arnold Schwarzenegger classic. Uh, and the name of our movie here is Total Recall. This H1 tag, of course, lives within that div that defines our movie. Now, some of these properties, actually, let me go back some slides here. Some of these properties use uh, very basic data types. Text, URL, date, I think there's a few other ones. Some of them are more complex data types. They actually use other schemas for the data types for those fields. For example, an actor is a person, and there's a whole schema for defining information related to a person. Um, a, the, the soundtrack to our creative work, the audio, as the property is called, is an audio object, which has its own set of fields pointing to a recording, and additional data about the recording itself. So when we get to more complex data about our movie, things like actors, uh, these tags can have children of their own. We specify the item prop. The item prop is, of course, actor. But then the item prop has its own 
on your scope and on your tongue. Here we're specifying the actor, the lead of this movie, of course, being Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you can see also, has his own properties. Arnold Schwarzenegger has a name. And this name is distinct from the name of the movie because it's within this particular item of scope. We can also use the meta tag. Thankfully, the HTML5 standard has changed the use of the meta tag. Previously, it could only live in the head section of your page up on top. This is how you specify things like keywords, which nobody uses anymore, or a meta description. Now the meta tag can live anywhere in an HTML5 document, anywhere in the body. And we can use it to make data be visible to the user, to the person looking at the site in their browser. We can also use it to provide machine-readable alternative content. Sometimes we need to specify things with more precision, especially dates and times. And we want to have a more human-readable, human-understandable people looking at things in the browser. And the meta tag is perfect for that. So here, maybe we want to describe uh, Mr. Schwarzenegger's previous job title. Uh, so next to his name, we have a meta tag for his item prop job title, specifying that he's the former governor of California. This probably isn't useful for anybody looking for information about total recall, but maybe you want the search engines to be aware about this. Maybe you want them to include your results in searches for former governors. I don't know. I can't, I can't explain that for you. You can also use it again for specifying things like dates, where you need a machine-readable format. This is especially important for localization. If you've done anything uh, internationally, is today 7-14, right? This is July 14. Is today 7-14 or 14-7? The schema.org standard specifies that you can give the date in the ISO 8601 format. Year, month, day, and then the letter T, and then hour, minute, second, and then an offset for time zone. And you're able to specify that in a meta tag, allowing the search engines to drill down to exactly that particular moment in time and still provide a meaningful date for, for people looking at the site and browser. This is actually the date published. This is the, movie, uh, the day that uh, Total Recall premiered, June 1st, 1990. And once you've added this markup, your, your item scope, item type, and item prop, you can run it through a validator. Much like we've used HTML and CSS validators through the years, Google and Bing both provide tools for parsing out this uh, microdata markup in our sites. They provide a whole breakdown of here's all the things I found within the, the page, and here's all the things we found within those pages. Here's the value of the properties, here's the, the other schemas we found within those properties. They both live in their respective Webmaster Tools products. Google calls theirs the Rich Snippets tool, and Bing calls theirs the Bing Markup Value. They're both very easy to use, they're free. I definitely recommend trying them out. Since this is a WordCamp, of course, I figured I should have at least one slide mentioning WordPress. <laughs> Otherwise, you guys are going to complain. So, um, again, I'm assuming you guys can use HTML, right? You can add this markup yourselves. But I do want to give you some ideas of how this could be useful on a WordPress site. For example, WordPress has really good support for menus either through the menu editor or through arranging pages in the hierarchy. And when you're rendering that menu, you might want to include the schema.org markup for site navigation element to tell the search engines, hey, this is the primary means of navigating this website. And again, they're able to grab that, and sometimes they'll even reproduce your menu structure right in the search engine results, making sure people can get right to the information they're after. In fact, uh, just recently, Google announced that they're actually doing things like flyout menus in those search results. They're, they're really looking to replace your site navigation with theirs. Again, to get people right to the content they're after. When you're doing your loop, uh, you know, get have posts, get posts, uh, be sure to mark up those, those blog posts with the schema for blog so that Google and Bing know that this is a piece of blog content and they can make sure it appears not just on the main Google site, but on any other affiliated sites that might want to carry blog content. I don't know if they do the specific Google blog search anymore. I think that was discontinued, but you get the idea. 
Also look at custom post type templates. I don't know how many of you are aware that the, the WordPress template hierarchy lets you specify a custom template for a custom post type. And you can use this, uh, let's say you have a recipe website. You might want to mark up that taco recipe with special recipe markup. And this is how you do it. You can also develop custom templates for contact, about pages, any page. Uh, basically, I believe you specify the page ID and the file name. And this is how you can tell Google, this is how people get in touch with me, and this is a page describing myself or my company. When I was at Straight North and we decided to adopt microdata markup for our websites, for our clients' websites, we did a little experiment. Again, search engine optimization seems like a black art sometimes. We wanted to make sure that there really was a benefit to doing this. So we did an experiment. We took our executive, executive profiles page. This is a list of people, everyone from the CEO on down to the development manager. And we marked up their profiles on the website with uh, all sorts of metadata markup. And we identified 48 keywords we were targeting. You can find the results in our blog at blog.straightnorth.com. And uh, just in, in a quick summary here, interestingly enough, there was no change on Google. And this really wasn't a surprise. Google has admitted that they don't use microdata markup to affect search engine result positions. But one thing they do use it for is building those rich snippets, and they're building in support for additional snippets more and more every day. Things like sports scores and recipes and reviews. So even if they're not using the particular markup that you're using now, there's a good chance they'll support it in the future to build richer search results. Bing, on the other hand, again, they need to differentiate themselves from Google, right? Bing actually does use the, uh, the microdata markup to affect search engine positions. So for those 48 keywords we targeted, 15 of them actually increased in their position in uh, Bing's search results. One decrease, we're not entirely sure why. And interestingly enough, we started to be ranked for 13 keywords we were never ranked for before. Bing suddenly took an interest in ranking our executive profiles for these terms. So this was a definite net benefit for us. So in conclusion, uh, one meme that I've started hearing is that search engine optimization is dead since Panda and Penguin came along. And again, as somebody who doesn't make his living every day doing that anymore, I can tell you that that's completely far from the truth. Okay? But it is an industry in transition right now. There are big changes going on. The search engines have grabbed more power for themselves. And it's a new, new paradigm. It's about search engine firms and websites having a relationship with the search engines, giving them as much information possible about the things we're doing, and letting them take control of how things look. And certainly the metrics that we measure to, to determine the success of our search engine optimization efforts, those are changing as well. We used to measure page traffic and specific keywords used in searches to bring people to our sites. Now we're going to have to start looking at uh, we're going to have to look at how happy our customers are and how quickly people are converting, and looking at using other tools like specific phone numbers for uh, different search engine results and things like that to identify which people are coming directly through the search engine. I don't have the slides up there just yet, but these will be posted on my SlideShare account, and uh, I possibly on the WordCamp site. Nobody's mentioned anything about that. So, any questions? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, do we have a microphone? Okay. Um, so, so you said that um, most of the stuff is just judgment, just what you feel is best with your data. Uh, how much time should be put into um, adding these? Like how detailed should we get on our websites? As detailed as you're comfortable with. Um, because this is part of the HTML markup, especially if you're building a site from scratch, it doesn't take a lot of additional effort to find the schemas out there and just add them, item scope, item type, item prop, as you're building a page out. 
And if you're making edits to an existing site, you definitely have to, to figure out which, uh, you know, if, if it's worth your time. Uh, again, Google doesn't make a lot of use of this. If you're targeting Google over Bing, that's definitely something to take into consideration. My personal feeling is this standard and other things like it are the future of search engine optimization. So it's good to be in on it on the ground floor and start doing it now. And get used to building it in. Yes? So right now, uh, I might have a plugin on my sites that will allow the users to enter in uh, some SEO descriptions, whether that tag is on the editing of them. So that when they're posting the article, they're also posting this information. Yeah, something like uh, Yoast SEO or uh, WordPress SEO. Precisely. That's right. Are, are these plugins, um, and, and Yoast is maybe one of the leading ones that is not, but I'm using it as an example, uh, are they building in more fields to be able to accommodate these new meta tagging areas, or is there something you can recommend that we start to use? I don't know of any plugins that do it yet. I know people were asking for Yoast to begin supporting this uh, around January or so. I don't know if any support has been built in yet. The really hard part is it needs to be added to the markup on the page. And um, also, um, the, the markup, the, the microdata markup doesn't necessarily just get applied to the, the body of the page, too. It can be applied to things like sidebar widgets or your logo, too. And uh, plugins would have a hard time applying that extra markup to other things on the page like that. But as far as I know, it's something that's considering. I don't know if support is there for it yet. Uh, another thing you might see, too, if you start looking through the plugin repository, is there are previous standards for microdata. Things like HCARD and VCARD. That um, the goal with those was that you'd have browser plugins and eventually support within the browser that would be able to sniff out things like uh, an HCARD or VCARD within your page content and allow you to grab that bio and headshot and put somebody's contact information right in your address book from a web page. That never caught on, but Google and Yahoo made a big effort to start sniffing that out and adding it to their search results. So you will see plugins in the plugin repository too for doing things like that. And those will give you a little extra hand there. Anyone else? Yeah. That was fine. Yeah. This is my question. Is there commercial tools available that can add this there or expand the product? Sorry? Uh, commercial, commercial tools um, have capabilities to add this newer generation of SAN Marga or SEO. I don't know of any tools that exist for it. Um, it might be a good opportunity, um, either within WordPress or just an external tool for dealing with static HTML pages. Again, the hard part is making that judgment call of what particular element on the page represents what. You can certainly sniff out any Google Maps and mark it with map markup, but Google already knows that's a map. The real challenge is finding things like uh, just a static map graphic that uh, you drew on the back of the napkin and scanned in and identifying that as a map. And uh, really, that, that's a challenge for plugin authors. I'm glad to see that uh, people like uh, the guy behind Yoast are, are eager to take on the challenge. I just don't know if anybody has developed a tool to kind of retrofit it into an existing site. This will be our last question. Okay. So, with all the tags that you can add in the schema.org, uh, it seems like you, know, you do you can get really down into the, the details of every single element on the page. Oh, of course. What's to stop this, you know, the SEO black hat community from exploiting this to the maximum potential, right? And then we run into the uh, scenario where you know meta keywords no longer matter at search results, right? Are there any protections in place, or are we going to do a ton of work and then all of a sudden? I personally don't know what the search engines are doing to deal with that. I have a feeling that falls under the other things that were included with the Panda update. There are ways of sniffing out good sites versus bad sites, and I think they're really counting on that sort of logic versus trying to detect abuse of, of microdata. Uh, that definitely has come up, though. I read a blog post recently, somebody pointing out you can just mark up every product on your site as having five out of five stars. Nobody's going to know the difference, and it's going to show up in those rich snippets as, hey, this is a great product. Everyone agrees. Um, and I definitely think, 
Google is going to have to get smart. Google and Bing, I don't want to leave Bing out here. Um, they are going to eventually get wise to it and start seeing certain trends developing. But again, it's a, it's a new, new thing that they've added, so we'll see where it goes. I'm sure they, they have a few ideas, they just haven't implemented them yet. Or maybe they have and they haven't told us. I guess that's it. We might have time for one more if anyone has anything burning. We have someone up front. So there's OpenGraph and uh, schema.org. What is the benefit of using either one? Um, are they compatible with each other? I mean, they're both forms of metadata, right? They definitely are. Um, I don't know if uh, Google or even Bing are using the OpenGraph. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's a Facebook? No, actually, yeah, I was going to say Google did a little something with OpenGraph in the beginning. But yeah, uh, mostly what I've seen Open Graph for, to be honest, is putting a, a picture and a, a little text snippet in uh, Facebook links. There's there's a little bit of mark. I think it was based on RDFA. And yeah, it's RDF based, definitely. Um, the hidden thing that's going to pop up on Facebook. <laughs> um, my uh, my personal take is that uh, Schema.org definitely seems to have the most weight behind it. Again, because Google is behind it, Bing is behind it. Yahoo is as well, for whatever that's worth. Yandex, I personally don't use them, but again, I've heard they're pretty big in other parts of the world. Um, that said, it doesn't take that much additional work to support all, so you might as well consider throwing that support in there because it takes time to make use of them. And uh, future proof your websites, I guess. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming.